Thank you so much, Simon, for, for the introduction. Really nice to be chatting to, to everyone this evening um, on the JSC. Uh, looking forward to unpacking all of, the, all of the different interesting discussion points. I was going to ask my colleague, Chantal, if she doesn't mind sharing the slide. Um, for some reason, mine uh, has stopped sharing from my side. I just want to open up my first slide to, to kick off. Um, but basically, the, the, this evening, we're going to be talking about a range of different instruments, so, so ETFs, ETNs, unit trusts. And I think we, we're going to include a bit of a diversification element as well from, from the educational unpack. I think the, the importance of understanding diversification and, and more importantly, geographical diversification um, is, is essential first in getting into some of these international assets and why we should look to include them and, and why they add to that diversification element. Um, perfect. I just want to quickly go back to my first slide here. Um, in terms of diversification, there's a graph that I love to use uh, just to kick off the conversation because I think diversification is one of those terms that we, that we hear about a lot in the investment world that we really need to understand. If we hear that we need to include a basket of assets within our investment portfolio, we need to balance our fund. But what exactly does that mean? So if we have a look at this, this graph, and it looks it looks hugely technical, but we only we're only focusing on a few on a few simple elements. And, and really it comes down to portfolio risk. So portfolio risk is what we reduce by diversifying our portfolios correctly. And what I want to bring your attention to in this graph is that as we include assets within our portfolio, so the theory states that our portfolio risk will decrease. But what's interesting to note is that that is only effective up until a certain point. If we look at the graph and reducing portfolio risk there through diversification, through adding more assets and more shares to our portfolio, it's only effective up until a certain point. So once we get to 20 shares and more, you can see that we have diversified that portfolio as much as we possibly can. And simply adding volume of shares and volumes of assets to the portfolio is really not going to add any further benefit. So really what I'm getting to with regards to this point is that diversification is more of a quality gain than a quantity gain. We need to be looking at assets that move in different directions to one another, assets that behave differently under different market events and market circumstances. And really, if we think about COVID-19 in March last year, when South Africa went into its first major lockdown, we saw how the JSC pulled back in the equity market on account of that news. But then we also saw over the course of the year how investors turned to commodities, for example, gold. So gold is a commodity that is seen by investors a bit of a safe haven. We also saw uh, the US stock market, for example, perform unbelievably well when the world went into lockdown on account of the increased use of technology. So therefore, it's not just about including a huge quantity of shares or assets within the portfolio. It's about adding different types of assets, different asset classes, and different geographic locations within the portfolio to help mitigate that risk as much as possible and decrease portfolio risk as much as possible. If we think about investing, at that age old saying of putting all your eggs in one basket, don't put all your eggs in one basket, that can be linked back to the JSC. If we're only investing in South Africa, we're placing all of our eggs in the South African basket, and that's not necessarily a good thing to do on account of, well, if something bad happens in South Africa, if there are negative moves in the market, for example, on the JSC specifically, then you need some exposure to international assets to help shelter those potential pullbacks. Geographic diversification. So we've now covered the importance of geographically diversifying our portfolio. But how do we do that as an investor? Well, there are a few options. So firstly, there's investing directly offshore. So what that means is taking physical rands offshore and investing directly in international stock markets. Some things that you've got to keep in mind with regards to doing this is that you have to obviously comply with the offshore allowance of a million rand per year per investor, and yet you want to go down the road of obtaining tax clearance to open up to 10 million. But for most investors, the million rand threshold is typically exceeding with regards to complying and taking funds offshore. Second major consideration around direct investing is the capital requirements or capital that's going to be required to invest directly in the international markets. If we look at certain shares like Amazon, for example, trading at $3,300, 50,000 Rand roughly for a share, what that means is that we're going to probably need a large amount of capital in order to get a diverse basket offering. We don't want to be taking money offshore and only investing in one or two shares because, again, we're not necessarily then geographically diversifying our portfolios correctly. We want to have exposure to multiple international assets. 
Foreign exchange gains and losses also also a consideration when taking funds directly offshore. Should the RAND strengthen against the dollar, for example, then there might potentially be foreign exchange losses that you would need to keep in mind and take into account, and same with vice versa. And then lastly, want to buy and when to buy. These are international markets, so it can be a little bit daunting when looking to take funds directly offshore, especially for an investor that's just entering into the market. So maybe it's not the best thing to go directly invest offshore straight away in a market that you're potentially unfamiliar with and in stocks and companies that you potentially haven't had exposure to. What are the alternatives for local investors to obtain international exposure? Well, there are fantastic instruments called unit trusts, exchange traded funds and exchange traded notes, which I'm going to get into now with regards to the unpack. So local instruments that you can purchase on the JSE or through local financial institutions that tick that box with regards to diversification. Let's start off with unit trusts, so probably one of the most familiar types of asset classes with regards to obtaining offshore exposure locally for a basket instrument. So a unit trust, a collective fund, an elective investment scheme, pooling of investors' funds for a fund manager to then go and select assets based on that specific unit trust's fund mandate. Not a listed instrument, so you cannot buy and sell a unit trust on the JSE or any other market. You would need to purchase the unit trust through the financial institution that has put that specific unit trust together. The fund manager, once all the investors' funds have been pulled together, buys and sells the different assets that are ticking the fund mandates and the fact sheet, so they control the buying and selling of those specific assets. And then as an investor that tracks the underlying assets that the fund manager is selecting, and then by buying a unit of that specific unit trust, you then gain exposure to all of those assets within the unit trust. Very important to note is that through a single investment, you get access to a basket of asset classes and a basket of different shares or access to a certain index. So it's a nice basket offering that a unit trust offers. So if you're a South African investor looking to invest internationally locally, there are different unit trusts that can tick your specific long-term goals and your investment strategy and allow you to get access to multiple international assets through a single investment. The exchange traded fund, almost a close sibling of the unit trust, very, very similar type setup, other than an exchange traded fund is a listed instrument. So you as an investor can buy and sell that specific basket of assets then on the JSC directly. Unit trust basket of assets, also managed by a fund manager, that you need to buy and sell that to the financial institution that has put together that specific unit trust. Then there's the less well-known cousin, the exchange traded notes, and again, a very effective instrument in obtaining international trade locally. And where the major difference comes in with an exchange traded note is that it is not a collective fund. It's not a collective investment scheme. It's actually a senior debt note. So it's very similar to a corporate bond. So if we think about lending money to a corporate and in return we receive interest income in the form of coupon payments, a exchange traded note has been put together by a financial institution to allow you as an investor to obtain indirect exposure to a certain asset or a certain asset class. Again, it's a listed instrument, so similar to an exchange traded fund, you can buy and sell an exchange traded note on the stock exchange or on the JSC. A major, major difference here with regards to the unit trusts and the ETFs is that an exchange traded note does not have any assets being bought and sold within that exchange traded note. As an investor, you obtain indirect exposure with regards to the investment product that has been put together by the financial institution like FNB. There is no fund manager buying and selling assets on that note for half, like you see with regards to a unit trust and exchange traded fund. And then as an investor, you obtain exposure to the underlying asset indirectly. And this can be a single asset exposure, which is also the major difference then between unit trusts and exchange traded funds. So typically through your unit trusts and your ETFs, you're getting access to a basket of assets, a wide variety of assets through a single investment. You can get single asset exposure to an exchange traded note. So if, for example, you want exposure to Tesla, you can buy a single asset exposure ETN or Tesla ETN. And then again, the correlation comes is that as the actual Tesla international company listed in America performs well and the share price increases, so the value of that exchange traded note will also increase in value that you have purchased as an investor on the JSE.
Okay, so the last point there is that an ETN is also bought and sold on the exchange like the JSE. Diving into it a little bit more detail in terms of what exactly an ETN is. So it's an unsecure bond that mirrors the underlying asset. So like we just covered, very similar to a corporate bond type instrument, it's a debt instrument that the financial institution like FNB puts together that allows you as an investor to obtain indirect exposure to a specific asset. The underlying asset that you're obtaining exposure to is tracked and not owned. So it's not owned by you and it is not owned by the financial institution. You as the investor are obtaining indirect exposure to that specific asset class. And it's correlated, positively correlated to underlying asset performance. Like I said, if for example, you have purchased a Tesla ETN and the actual share company Tesla increases in price, so you will see the correlation then between the exchange trade and those prices versus the actual test for share price, and that you can gain access to locally then on the JSE. It's a debt product where credit risk is taken on the financial institution. So the financial institution, for example, FNB that has put together the exchange traded note is essentially who the credit risk is on with regards to you as an investor, because the bank or the financial institution that has compiled the exchange traded note offers you exposure to that asset class through the instrument that's where the credit risk lies. You're not buying and selling shares directly, and neither is the financial institution that's put together the note, which is our major difference then between your unit trusts and your ETFs. In terms of why investors would look to buy ETFs and invest in ETFs, so very importantly is that straight away, this offers you exposure to international markets through a locally listed instrument. And I think that's something that's very important. So, for some investors that just haven't got rounds to geographically diversifying your portfolio, just to the sheer daunting side of, it, of, of the nature of taking funds directly offshore or not knowing which specific assets to invest in, an exchange traded note offers someone comfort in that it's a JSE listed instrument, it's familiar, it's something that we know, we can buy it immediately. It does not impact our offshore allowance either, which is also a major benefit. So remember, we've only got a million rand to take directly offshore. So buying and selling ETNs locally on the JSE, even though you get exposure to these big international companies, it doesn't impact the offshore allowance. Thirdly, you do not need huge amounts of capital to invest. So we covered that in one of my first slides to say that the capital required to invest directly offshore can be significant in order to get the correct exposure to a basket or a wide variety of international assets. If, for example, you don't have those huge amounts of capital to invest directly offshore, it means that you can obtain immediate exposure through an ETN from as little as 10 Rand. So your Rand really goes a long way in allowing you as an investor, regardless of your capital budget, to obtain offshore exposure and add that element of geographic diversification to your portfolio as a whole. Fourthly, investors can decide whether or not they want to hedge the currency risk. Again, as an investor, if you take funds directly offshore, you need to take into account that there are going to be foreign exchange gains and foreign exchange losses. One of the advantages of a locally listed ETN is that you can decide whether or not you want to take that currency risk or whether or not you want to buy and sell that specific ETN in South African rands. You can obtain single asset exposure to companies like Amazon, Netflix, Apple. So again, with an ETF and a unit trust, you're getting a basket offer where with a locally listed exchange traded note, you can decide on the individual companies that you would like to get exposure to through the note. You can also obtain exposure to complex asset classes such as copper or commodities such as copper, silver, and oil. So complex commodities that may be difficult as an individual investor to find the right ones with the right specific notes to invest in. An ETN makes it a little bit simpler, it puts it there right there for you, which tells me going to take you through the practical side of including these commodity type investments within your portfolio. But an ETN is a really nice way to make investment, complicated specific investment asset classes, much more simple, much simpler, and much more achievable from a local front. Investing in ETN makes geographically diversifying your portfolio easy and cost effective through a locally listed instrument that you can buy and sell on the JSE. I think gone are the days of saying it's very complicated, it's for the ultra high net worth individuals that are taking money offshore and diversifying through international investments. It's all been brought, it's familiar to us, it's accessible, it's cost effective, and through the locally listed ETNs, as an investor, we can now obtain exposure to some of the biggest international companies in the world, which is a fantastic thing to do. This is where my side of the presentation has ended. I'm going to hand over to my colleague Chantal now to take you through some of the practical issues around these instruments. Okay, great. So, I mean, I, I, I'm thinking 
when we're talking about ETNs and ETFs generally, that everyone is kind of comfortable with the idea of owning the market, not to steal a tagline from, from one of our competitors. But generally, there are also alternative uses for ETNs and ETFs that we don't really speak about a lot. So my section in this in this presentation is going to, to try and get a grip on what the alternative uses for ETNs and ETFs are. Um, outside of just being a basket of shares that track the JC, for example. Um, so I, it, I'm taking a, a three-pronged approach, and I'll start with offshore exposure, which is something that Nick has spoken to um, as well. And there are basically two ways that you can use ETFs and ETNs to gain offshore exposure. Uh, the first being exposure to a basket, right? So if you have exposure to JSE listed shares or uh, exchange traded funds or exchange traded notes that track shares that are listed on the JSE, uh, you can add to your diversification or you can diversify further by investing in an ETF uh, or an ETN that has global exposure. That's a basket of shares. So um, you can essentially own the world and uh, get more geographic or get, get more geographically focused. Uh, for example, there are specific ETFs and ETNs listed on the JSE that give you exposure to um, only the NASDAQ, for example, or China. So um, you can really get creative there as well. And then the, the single stock ETNs um, that Nick spoke about as well. Um, I think this is a really great and unique offering from FNB. And I'm not just talking my, my own book yeah, but there are 17 FNB ETNs and counting. Uh, I know that the team are planning to, to list even more. Um, and these are great names, um, mostly US, um, US companies, big US companies that we all know. Um, and it's a way of gaining exposure to those companies without paying $3,300 for the likes of an Amazon. Um, and because you already have a basket of 17 stocks uh, that have almost been kind of pre-screened by the guys at F&B as well, um, you have an opportunity to look at some of these as to look at some of these companies as, and adding them into your own portfolios, gaining that offshore exposure and getting a little bit more specific. Uh, this really helps when uh, we are in a period like we are right now, where, for example, the US market looks super expensive, but there are still pockets of value in there. They are still companies that can offer you good returns, even though the expectation is that returns from uh, the US market uh, in the near term might not be that great. What the, the single stock ETNs also offer you and some of the other ETNs um, in the F&B offering is taking currency risk or not. So generally, um, I like taking currency risk when I'm investing offshore just because the, the RAND is fundamentally and structurally a weakening currency. This is just because of interest rate and inflation differentials between us and the United States, for example. Uh, but there are periods in which the RAND can strengthen quite dramatically. Um, and during those times, your investment can actually underperform if you don't hedge your currency risk. So the nice thing about this is if you want to be a little bit more technical about these things, you can actually hedge your currency risk and invest in an, an ETN without taking um, any sort of a RAND risk. And then the second alternative uh, to just buying a basket of shares um, is looking at exposure to single commodities and I say without strings attached. And uh, what I mean by that is that when you are investing in the mining industry, for example, you are taking a view on a specific commodity, but you're also taking a view on the operational success of that mine. Um, are they going to have production stoppages? Are they going to have safety issues? Um, what about the management team? Are they being too aggressive with the way that they're allocating capital? Are they going to waste your money? Um, are costs going to go up by too much because they're getting loosey-goosey um, in a high commodity price environment? Um, and if you are looking at, um, at, at investing in commodities without those strings attached, there's an ETF or an ETN for that. Um, with the more complex commodities, it's actually um, quite cool to know that you can invest in an exchange traded note. Um, sometimes it just gets too complicated with an exchange traded fund. Uh, a great example of that is, is with oil. Um, if, for example, you want to have an exchange traded fund tracking oil, you'll actually have to store that oil somewhere. You'll have to buy that oil and you'll have to have those barrels sit somewhere. 
Whereas when you're looking at an exchange traded note, you're just tracking the oil price. You don't necessarily have to, to sit with, um, with barrels and barrels of oil um, in a warehouse somewhere. So this just allows you to get exposure to some of those more, more complex commodities. Um, and then the third thing, which is probably um, my favorite area in the exchange traded fund and exchange traded note uh, space, and it's, it's really getting very exciting on the JSE from this perspective, is thematics. So what are themes? They're big ideas. They are, they are what we think the world's going to look like in future um, and where we think the world is heading. And sometimes we can actually see it for, the, for ourselves, but we don't necessarily think about or know how to invest in a changing world. Um, but there is a, an ETF or an ETN for that. And um, if you look at some of the more recent listings in the exchange traded notes and exchange traded fund space, um, guys are really, or, or the, the, the guys who are listing these instruments are, are seeing the way that the world's changing. And uh, maybe you agree that the world is changing in the same way that they are seeing it change. Um, and an ETN or an ETF can give you an opportunity to invest longer term um, in, in things that you may not have thought possible uh, before. So um, this last slide from my side is actually a little bit busy. I've broken it up into to three easy animations, but it's basically our best ideas around the exchange traded fund and exchange traded node space, um, covering the three alternative themes that I've just covered. Um, in offshore exposure, uh, as I mentioned before, the US market has performed very well over the last 18 months. Um, so even though we might not see value in the US market as a whole right now, we still see value in some of the single single stock names. So if you look at the JSE listed FMB ETNs, um, a stock like Activision Blizzard, which is a big gaming company, um, actually still looks uh, quite cheap relative to its earnings expectations. Uh, similarly, um, Visa, PayPal and Adobe as well look like they're offering decent value and Amazon as well, even though it's an expensive stock, um, if you look at it on using certain valuation metrics like a PE ratio, for example, um, if you're going to start forecasting cash flows, it, um, it still looks quite compelling and the story is certainly an exciting one. Um, then across markets, the recent China equity sell-off might also offer an opportunity and there's an ETF for that. Um, so just perhaps something worth considering um, when you are looking at your portfolio in the, in the week ahead. Then within commodities, uh, commodity prices have come under quite a bit of pressure. So there may be an opportunity to gain exposure in the space, um, as I mentioned, without strings attached. We've started, we've started seeing capital expenditure increase within mining companies. We've seen costs increasing, um, but in some of these areas, um, there's still value. We think that there's still value, for example, in platinum. Platinum has underperformed some of the other PGM PGMs um, over the last few years, and there's a massive deficit, so there might be an opportunity, an opportunity there. And then finally, and my favorite part, thematic expression. So ESG um, is a really cool um, area of the market that we we can't ignore. Uh, investors really can't ignore the fact that you need to start thinking about sustainability when you're investing. Um, not only we are big institutional investors looking at sustainability, but it's it's probably if you are going to look at companies that take the environmental damage they inflict seriously, uh, the societies uh, in which they operate as well as the stake, uh, stakeholder relationships like employee relationships and all the rest of it seriously, and are uh, super strict on on based in um, based in class governance. You are probably going to find a company that's going to be sustainable and that's going to be around. For, for the longer term. Um, with FMB, we've launched uh, three ESG focused um, exchange traded notes more recently. Um, there's a, a clean water note or a water note um, which invests in, uh, in an, an index or which tracks an index which invests in some of the largest companies focused on water um, in the world. We have a clean energy ETN, uh, very similar, but just focusing on clean energy and a socially responsible ETN, which looks at companies that really take those, those, those big factors, those big ESG factors um, into account. Um, perhaps just an honorable mention to the Satrix inclusion and diversity 
um, index as well, even though it's not going to provide you with offshore exposure specifically, it's a really great way of, of investing in JSE listed South African companies that take these things, that take inclusion and diversity um, extremely seriously. Um, and in the South African context, I think it's even more important than, than it is in the global space. Um, the second kind of big thematic is this, this fourth industrial revolution. Um, and the track record of the, the Signia Fourth Industrial Revolution ETF really speaks for itself. Um, it's, it's a really great uh, product and it really looks at industries of the future um, and it, industries that will change the, the world and, and the way that we, that we do things really. Um, and, and that's also always a, an interesting one to, to have a look at, especially if it's been under a little bit of pressure. Um, the third big thema thematic um, that I want to draw your attention to is infrastructure. So infrastructure, I think, is going to be a very important one to look at over the next year or two, maybe even a little bit longer. Um, a lot of countries have kind of signaled that they are looking to invest in infrastructure in order to stimulate the economy um, out of, out of a, a bit of a slump post-COVID-19. Um, in South Africa, there's, it's, it's very similar. We don't necessarily have an ETN for that yet, um, but there is an infrastructure ETF um, available that looks at global infrastructure players, um, which I think is, is, is really brilliant um, and could give you an opportunity to invest in infrastructure as well. Um, the thing I really like about infrastructure investments is it, it almost ties into ESG for me because infrastructure and meaningful infrastructure expenditure actually improves the lives of people on the ground. Um, a, a, a town or a, or a village with no road um, actually has very little prospects. But if government or the private sector invests in a road um, and there's a way of earning a return on that road, um, it, it is actually a win-win situation for the investors in that road as well as for the people who, who live in those communities. Um, and then finally, Midcaps. Ashburton has a has a Midcap ETF that tracks the Midcaps uh, on the JSC. It's also really great, and I think we we also see most of the value um, on the local boards uh, right now. And that is that is my story, um, Simon. Cool. Do we have any questions yet? We have questions coming galore. Chantal, Nick, appreciate the time. Uh, folks, if you've got questions, drop them into the box. We've got a bunch of them already. Ian's asking particularly uh, around ETM volumes. He says, volumes traded are small. Does this create a wide gap between buy and sell price? Can this make it difficult to sell? An ETM, much like an ETF, will have a market maker kind of keeping it at that fair value, not so. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you should have a market make, maker that keeps it at that value, and because you are tracking a specific a specific index, um, you you typically shouldn't see too much of a deviation um, like you would in a normal stock because you don't have that that um, that state issue that you would um, in, for example, a small cap that is also um, lightly traded. Another question coming through versus the currency versus no currency impact. So they get issued in two flavors. One, the, the Rand dollar is, is part of the equation. Chantal, you said that's typically your preferred because structurally the Rand will, will weaken, although at times it doesn't. The question is, how do we tell them apart? And I've got mm -hmm. a trick for this one. So they're compos and quantos. And the compo, correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> the compo is the one that tracks the currency and therefore it ends in a C and that's how you know that it's the currency one. Absolutely correct, Simon. Okay. So they have the same code. If it ends in a Q, no currency. If it ends in a C, got the currency coming through. The question coming through, particularly around on the ETNs, if the investor in FMB doesn't hold the underlying asset, how is then the performance linked to the asset? Yeah, so I mean those are the those are the the, the very clever guys in the in the background that <laughs> that work on that. But um, typically they do have their ways of of buying exposure um, through through derivative instruments. So it gets super complicated, but they they get very close to to tracking it um, almost perfectly. I think it's just important to know that the the, the actual share isn't 
purchased. Yeah, yeah. No, and it's a fair shot. I, I've been tracking uh, the Activision Blizzard one I particularly like, um, and it works. I mean, it does what it says on the sticker, uh, which is what you want it to. Another question coming through from uh, Shamil asking around, can I put these into a tax-free account? The answer is Unitrusts, yes. ETFs, yes. ETNs, not. No, not yet. Yeah, not yet. Um, uh, with regards to ETFs and unit trusts, absolutely. So when when opening up your tax-free savings accounts, you can decide, you know, to include that specific basket of assets there within the tax-free savings accounts. But unfortunately, not ETFs as of yet. So Howard has a great question I'd never thought of. If an ETN is a debt instrument, is any gain regarded as interest? No, so I mean the, the the gain would obviously be capital gain from an investment point of view, but it is a very interesting it is yeah. a very interesting question that's been that's been posed obviously with the with, with the debt side. Um, you know, on the surface, you no, know, it would obviously be a it would be a capital gain under sort of traditional investment circumstances. But yeah, I think great question, Hard, and I think something that we could potentially raise with some of the, the clever guys with the, with the big glasses in the back end, like Chantal's mentioned. <laughs> um, yeah, to to potentially chat for you about it. Um, I don't know, Chantal, if you've got anything to add on on that. <laughs> no, I I think that I think that the the debt instrument side um, get that the, the the interest side and the the complicated tax or the tax complications around that kind of lie within the instrument rather than with the end yeah. investor. Um, yeah, as I I also understand it as it just being capital gains like a normal um, investment that you buy and sell on the JSE except for a REIT. Yeah, well, yeah, except for a REIT. <clears throat> now, Howard, uh, excuse me. I I, I mean it, I, I like your thinking, but in essence. For me as the investor, I buy it, it goes up. As far as SARS is concerned, I've made a capital gain. I haven't received a coupon or an interest payment. You're asking if they've, if SARS has given a directive. I, no tax experts here, I'm not sure. But I can tell you that I have bought and sold ETNs and I have paid the standard CGT, notwithstanding the 40,000 allowance, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a question from Karen. Uh, what happens to dividends on the ETN? Perfect. So, so because the, the underlying asset um, is actually not acquired by specific, you know, by the specific notes or the financial institution, so there's no actual buying of the asset. So there wouldn't necessarily be a dividend that would be received, but the way that would obviously be received or the way you would obviously share benefit in that from an investment side is that that would obviously be correlated into the increase in ETN's price. Okay, got you on that. Uh, another question coming through is uh, apparently ETNs expire. They do. What what is and I'm not sure. I think are these are yours. I think yours are issued at ten years or they five year uh, ETNs. What is likely to happen at expiry? What's that process going to look like? Yeah, I mean, I I I think that you'll we'll have to see when we when we get there. Um, the one of two things usually happen, either you kind of roll over the exposure or, or you have to reissue. Um, but I think that that is still a, a little way out. Um, and I actually will have to get back to you on that. I think that's probably a question worth asking the 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 guys, <laughs> the, the, the smart guys upstairs. I, from, from my experience, and I know because Standard Bank issued a bunch 10 years ago that expired, <clears throat> excuse me, late last year and then August this year. Uh, and one of two things, so in some cases they rolled them, in some cases they just shut them down because they hadn't been popular. Um, and in the one case, for example, the oil one, mm -hmm. which had previously tracked West Texas Intermediate, they moved into a, uh, a, a Brent oil instead. So it, it, I think it is to a point that kind of like, you know, at the end of the period, it's, it's going to be that decision. And I have gone and read, because I'm that sort of a nerd sometimes, I've read the listing docs, and because I like listing docs, mm. and they state there that uh, it could be at the discretion of the issuer in this case, the issuer is FNB. Howard, by mistake, I deleted one of your questions. If you could send it back to me, please, the one that was between the two that we answered, uh, if you could send that again so we can touch on that. Uh, question coming through around the clean energy, um, and I've got the list here. Is it is it renewable energy and the like? And, and it is. I mean, the, the largest holding is uh, Vestas Wind Systems at just over 7%. Uh, second largest holding, 
uh, again, wind farms uh, generating heat from power stations. Chantal, the question was around the, the, the concept of thematic and what, what, what the question is, you, you mean those long trends that are going to play out, I mean, not just in the next five years or so, but potentially over a large portion of our investing lifetime? Yeah, I, I think that it's it's very important to start thinking about what the to think about what you think the world is going to look like in 10, 15, 20 years time if you're investing for the long term. Um, and I mean, it, you probably have to think th that far ahead in order to do well over the next one, two or three years, because markets are forward looking and they start looking at what the world will look like way in advance of, of, yeah. of it actually occurring. Um, I think that's why you've seen kind of little discrepancies in terms of the mispricing of coal assets over the last year or so uh, the market perhaps getting too carried away in terms of of looking forward instead of uh, thinking about the now but it, it's probably um it's generally the way that the market works it looks far ahead in the future and i think that while there's still currently a place for fossil fuels in the world um, it's going to be very difficult to see. It's very difficult for me to see these guys around in 50 years time. Um, but it's very easy for me to see um, the world continuing to harness the power um, of, of wind, of solar energy um, and, and just getting to that clean energy space um, where we can actually get to a, a cleaner, greener world and a world that might not heat up by a couple of decimals of degrees Celsius every single year. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, in our lifetime, I think the kids are going to look at us and say, you burnt fossil fuels? What were you thinking? The honest truth is, I suspect we weren't thinking. Kevin, you're asking at the end of the period, do we get charged capital gains before buying again? So that, and here there has been a directive, and here this is actually derivatives, um, and, and in this case, particularly share installments. But but the process is, if 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 the ETN ceases to exist, you get your cash back, and yes, there is a capital gain event. So let's take that Standard Bank Oil one. Uh, Johan shut down the West Texas. He started a Brent one, which meant that cash flowed into your account, and you had to actively go and buy the new one, and therefore that was what SARS refers to as a taxable event, and therefore tax was payable. If, however, it simply rolls into a new one, in other words, you're never given the cash, you had one, and they roll you into the new one. SARS does not deem that as a taxable event. However, you're going to have to keep really good notes in terms of initial purchase prices and all of that sort of thing. So it does depend how it actually goes. Uh, Howard, you're back with your question. Uh, if gains would be interest, if you hold a debt instrument and decrease would be capital loss and whether SARS is given investor directive. Yeah, so as I, I, I don't know of uh, an investor directive, but Howard, drop me an email because I've actually got a... A, a, a serious tax guru down in Cape Town, and I'm going to bounce them, bounce that off him, and and see what he has to say. Uh, Simon at justonelap.com. Uh, Ian, compared to buying and selling the actual shares, what are the effective costs for uh, these new ETNs that you've been issuing? What are your your management fees? I mean, obviously F&B is charging fees. What are your 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 management fees, or are they dependent on which ones they are? Yeah, it very much depends on which ones they are. So um, for the, the single stock ones, it would be a little bit less expensive. Um, it would actually be quite cheap. Um, if you're looking at the, the ESG ETNs where we are we, we are tracking an we, we are tracking an index um, or tracking an ETF that's tracking an index if we want to get quite technical about it. Um, it costs a little bit more. And then if you look at some of the we've we've recently launched a global equity growth um, ETF. Um, which is managed by uh, our team offshore. And there we actually have a whole team who looks at stocks and picks stocks for that specific ETF. And then that gets a little bit more expensive still. So um, the single stock ones are, are probably your, your cheapest bet at this point. Question coming through, where can they find a complete list of all the different stocks? Because there's bunches there. I mean, I think if I remember McDonald's and a whole bunch of others. Um, I don't know. So I, I, yeah. my broker has it, but also the easy cheat is etfsa.co.za. Um, and you can go find the list of, of uh, uh, all the, 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 just go to the ETN list and you'll see the F&B ones. That's Nirina Fissa and Mike Brown. Uh, Chantal, is that the easiest way to do it? That, that, that's how I do it. Oh, Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, for me to to have my whole my list of 17 single stock ETNs in my head is a little bit too much. Um, 
the older I get, the more I, the, I, um, I'm, I'm dependent on, on my outlook for, for my, um, <laughs> for memory. Um, but I actually have my browser open on my phone on etfsa.co.za and the tab ETNs. So <laughs> yeah, that is exactly the place where you'll get the list. I, I, I will drop it in. I mean, just for, for reference, I mean, it's Activision, Blizzard, Adobe, Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, Berkshire Hathaway. And the beauty is what Berkshire Hathaway is 200,000 US. Even the B shares are expensive. It's Coke, it's Facebook, it's Ford. It, it's a really nice mix. It's the clean energy, uh, some banks in there, Microsoft, Netflix. I will drop that into the chat box. Folks can go find that. Uh, it's usually where I go because also it links to all the, the, the uh, minimum disclosure documents, et cetera, et cetera. The next question, and I'm not sure if you're knowing or willing or able to answer, uh, which ones are coming next? Oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I I have I have my my ideas, but I won't be able to confirm anything right now. Um, but I know that the guys are looking at a list of about ten. Um, so yeah, it's it's coming, and we'll definitely uh, put something out there before it lists. I'm sure we'll we'll go out um, on the road and in the media as well, and um, everyone will will know about it. I think uh, before it happens or just as it happens. Yeah, and, and the next question was, can we send ideas? And the answer is absolutely you can. Uh, Chantal's on Twitter, go tweet Chantal, and she can pass it up the chain um, as it, it goes and, 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 and get it into the, 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 the different folks. Um, and I, I, I've certainly been sending a, a few ideas through to the, the, the boffins at FNB. Uh, folks, I'm not seeing any more questions coming through, so we will park it there for this evening. Uh, Chantal, Nick, really appreciate your time this evening. Uh, they are great products. I love them. I think they're a, a great addition to the investment world. A, a last question coming through quick. Why would I buy this um, as opposed to buying Amazon or Netflix directly. Uh, and I'll give a short answer, and then I'm going to hand it over to Nick and Chantal. I mean, short answer is you can. I mean, one of the issues, Berkshire Hathaway, $200,000 a share. Uh, that's more than my flat is worth. Um, it, it's, it's, it, it, there, there, there's pros and cons to both sides, and part of it is just the ease in Zar. Nick, I see you shaking your head there. Sorry, nodding your head. No, 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 correct. I no, 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 correct. I think they're, they're, you know, they're, they're different considerations. Number one depends on, on, on the capital that you have to invest um, because to go, and, you know, to go and buy Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, as we discussed, you know, you're going to need significant capital to get a diverse, you know, get a diverse sort of uh, offering with regards to share acquisitions that side. Um, and then also there's the offshore allowance. You know, you've also got to look at what have you bought you know, up until that point. Um, and, and if you, you know, on that, on that limit, then, then you know, potentially acquiring more international exposure through a locally listed instrument like an ETN is then something definitely worth considering. So I think those for me are the, are the two major considerations in terms of why not, you know, why not just go directly offshore? Well, if that's an option for you, then obviously that, that that's there. And if it's feasible, then you need to just consider the two options that I've just discussed now uh, before making that decision. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, Nick, just to add to that, I, I like having all my stuff in one place. So oh, me <laughs> call <too>. me crazy, <laughs> but I like having a platform and a portfolio and everything's there. And I mean, these shares are great and they're probably the ones that I would have bought offshore anyway. Um, but now they I'm buying them on the JSE. They're on my share trading portfolio. I can see them every day. I don't have to log into a different platform. It's It's just clean. I thought I was the only one who thought that. I, I agree with you 100%. I, I, and I know it's perhaps silly at places, but that, that's as it is. Um, are the single stocks always going to be in the USA? There's a question. Kieran's asking if, if you perhaps look at other markets. I remember speaking, and I forget the gentleman I spoke to last year when they first came out, and he said you would be potentially looking at Asia and, and Europe uh, at some point in the future. Yeah, absolutely. So as long as we can have it, um, we can have the the underlying um, that's also got an ADR or a, a secondary listing um, in Europe from a time zone perspective, mm -hmm. um, we can invest in it or we can we can launch an ETN on it. Um, it gets complicated when a stock doesn't isn't, for example, um, secondary listed or has a depository receipt um, in Germany or Switzerland or Luxembourg because then we're going to struggle to 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 trade or to not to trade it but to track it properly um 
but certainly, I mean, most of the, the, the very large companies that we are looking at um, internationally will fit that criteria. Um, and some of them will be in Europe and some of them will be in Asia. Um, I think the, the US stocks were just the, um, the logical place to start because yeah. we are so out of our depth in terms of technology exposure in the, on the JSC that it just made um, sense to, to go that route first. Back in Kizi, that's who I spoke to. It always comes back to me, always too late. Ladies and gents, we'll park it there. Uh, Chantal, Nick, really appreciate your time. Ladies and gents, thanks very much for your time this evening. Uh, next Power Hour is 21 October. It was supposed to be Killing and Glouville from Stanlib talking listed property. But he has left Stanlib, so it's not going to be Keelan. Uh, I don't know who it will be, but we will get an email out in the next couple of days inviting you to that. Uh, everyone, stay safe. Look after yourself if you can. Look after somebody else as well. Cheers, all.